Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I am your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. Last week, we continued to explore Julia under the hood by learning about metaprogramming and macros. Sadly, today is the final tutorial in this series. We'll start with a quick recap of everything we've learned during the past 12 weeks, and then we'll have a final exam by working on some fun projects. I'll wrap up by sharing some additional resources that are available so you can continue on with your adventure in coding with the Julia programming language. Finally, I'll have a parting gift for all of my subscribers at the end of this video. During the past 12 weeks, we used the Julia programming language to build a foundation of computer science and programming knowledge. We started by installing Julia, Adam, and Juno, which we used throughout the series as our programming environment. We learned the fundamentals of what a computer is and what a programming language is. Then we learned how to perform basic math in Julia. We learned about the relationship between variables, expressions, and memory. We also learned about Julia's various data types. We learned about different data structures like dictionaries, tuples, name tuples, and arrays. We learned about different control flows, specifically conditionals and loops, to begin transitioning from manual work to automation. We learn how to reuse our code using functions that we now know are mechanisms to achieve abstraction and decomposition. We also learn how to create our own custom functions. We learn about methods and multiple dispatch and how multiple dispatch is the secret sauce of Julia. We also learn how to create our own custom data types. We learn how to use the text editor and some debugging techniques. We also learn how to install packages and use the Maki package to generate some plots. Then we learned some intermediate concepts like algorithms, recursion, and program efficiency. We also started to dig around under the hood of Julia to learn how Julia takes source code all the way down to machine code. We wrapped up last week by learning about metaprogramming and macros. Now that's a lot of material to cover in 12 weeks. While this may not be enough to turn you into the next tech billionaire, you have to start somewhere, right? This should give you a solid foundation for whatever comes next for you. At the very least, it gives you the background to use the resources that are available online to continue pursuing your goals, whatever they may be. More importantly, I hope that you learned something about yourself during this series. Did you discover a new hobby that you want to pursue further, possibly making a career out of it? Or did you discover that you hate programming and that you never want to see it again? Let me know in the comments below if you had any personal breakthroughs. Either way, you learned something valuable about yourself. And isn't that really the essence of life? To grow as a person through self-discovery? Instead of a final exam, I thought we could work on some final projects so you'll have something to remember our time together. We're going to make four mini-games and save them as a .jl file. 1. 99 lines of code. 2. The Nim game. 3. Magic 8-Ball. And 4. Random Art Generator. The first three are from Rosetta Code, and the last one is inspired from an MIT lecture by Dr. John Gutag. The links are provided in the description below. Open a new document in your text editor and save it as myfinalprojects.jl. Move your REPL and dock it next to the workspace panel. Adjust the vertical bar as necessary. The idea behind this code comes from a popular song about an adult beverage container. It's a staple of school bus field trips and of bored kids everywhere. In order to keep things wholesome and family friendly, I've modified the lyrics slightly. Select all of the rows, including the markdown text, and then hit Shift Enter. Try singing your song in the REPL. <laughs> 
The Nim game is a simple game where the second player will always win, if they know the trick. The game has only three rules. 1. Start with 12 tokens. 2. Each player takes 1, 2, or 3 tokens in turn. And 3. The player who takes the last token is the winner. To win every time, the second player simply takes 4 minus the number the first player took. So if the first player takes 1, the second player will take 3. The first player takes 2, the second player should take 2. If the first player takes 3, then the second player should take 1. Select all of the rows, including the markdown text, and then hit Shift Enter. Try playing the game in the REPL. See? The house always wins. Predict your future using a magic 8 ball. Do they still sell these? When I was a kid, a lot of people had these magic 8 balls, which was a plastic sphere filled with bluish colored water. On the bottom of the sphere was a plastic window that you looked into. Inside the sphere was a multi-sided plastic die that would float up to the window when you turned the sphere over and looked at the window. The die had some random answers to yes-no questions printed on it. The way to play is to ask the Magic 8 Ball a yes or no question, and then shake the ball and turn it over to see how it replies. A popular question was, does he or she like me? Which gives you an idea of the age group for this toy. Fun, right? This is what the cool kids did back in the prehistoric times before there were video games. Of course, you can add or delete any response you like in the responses array. Select all of the rows, including the markdown text, and then hit Shift Enter. Discover the mysteries of the universe by using the Magic 8 Ball in the REPL. So wise, the Magic 8 Ball is. This final project is inspired by a YouTube video featuring Dr. John Guttag of MIT. In the video, he's teaching a class about random walk, which is a mathematical concept that has a lot of different real-world applications. Here's how the thought experiment goes. There's a person who starts at coordinate 0, 0. That person is allowed to take one step, either left, right, forward, or backwards. They cannot move diagonally, and they cannot stand still. The direction of that step is determined randomly, and there's an equal chance that the step will be any one of those four moves. After taking that first step, the person repeats the process for taking their next step. They can only move left, right, forward, or backwards. 
and that step is again determined randomly. They are allowed to retrace their steps, so if they move forward on their first step, they're allowed to move backwards on their second step. Here's the question. If you repeat this process multiple times, where does the person end up? Are the movements predictable, or are they simply random? Also, if you start with multiple people who start at the same point and move following the same instructions, where do they all end up? Do they all end up clustered around a similar area, or do they just scatter randomly? These are all fascinating questions to explore some other day. Since this is the last day of class, rather than learning more math, we're going to use the concept of random walk for something much more important, to generate some artwork. This project is made up of two functions. The first function randomly generates the steps and then stores the coordinates in arrays. Select all of the rows, including the markdown text, and then hit Shift-Enter. Try out your new function in the REPL. This function just creates the array for the x and y coordinates. We need another function to generate the actual artwork. Go back to the text editor. The second function takes the coordinates generated by the first function and generates a plot so we can visualize the random walk. I know that I promised no new concepts, but I wanted to include some random colors in these plots. In computing, there are several different ways to describe color. A common practice is to identify color using four channels, red, green, blue, and alpha. RGBF0 is a composite data type that is used in the Maki package that contains three fields for red, green, and blue. Each field is a floating point number with a value between 0 and 1. The combination of red, green, and blue values will create any visible color. Using RGBF0 with the RAND function generates a random color. The alpha channel is the transparency channel, which is also a floating point number between 0 and 1. An alpha of 0 means that you can't see the color at all, and an alpha of 1 means that you can see the color at full strength. An alpha of 0.5 means that you can see the color, but you can also see through it. It's like looking at light through colored glass. 
She liked all of the rows, including the markdown text, and then hit Shift Enter. In this case, the markdown text is much longer than the actual code. Try out your new artwork generator in the REPL. You can disregard that warning message. The first plot takes a long time to generate. All of the future plots will generate faster. This is one walker taking 10 random steps. This is one walker taking 100 random steps. Let's repeat this a couple times. This is one walker taking 1,000 random steps. Let's repeat this a couple times. This is two walkers taking 1,000 random steps each. Let's repeat this a couple times. This is three walkers taking 1,000 random steps each. Let's repeat this a couple times. This is 10 walkers taking 1,000 random steps each. Let's repeat this a couple times. This is 10 walkers taking 10,000 random steps each. It's starting to look like abstract art. Let's repeat this a couple times. This is 10 walkers taking 100,000 random steps each. It's starting to look like an oil painting. Let's repeat this a couple times. This is 100 walkers taking 100,000 random steps each. At this point, it really does look like an abstract oil painting on canvas. Because the image is created using just horizontal and vertical lines, it looks like paint being captured by the threads of a rough canvas. And because the colors are translucent, it looks like there are layers of paint on top of each other. Note that Maki is generating vector graphics meaning that there is no loss in resolution as you zoom in on the details. However, if you save this image as a PNG file, the resolution will not be as good. Repeat this a few more times until you find one that you like.
I'm going to go with this one. Pretty cool, right? Before we go, let's do some housekeeping. Save your plot as a PNG file. And save your text file. It makes you wonder, when you see artwork, is it talent or is it just random? Let's ask the Magic 8-Ball. Julia is never wrong. Hopefully, this isn't the end of your journey, but merely just the beginning. Although this tutorial series has come to an end, there are plenty of resources online to help you stay on the path. You can find help in line using the question mark in the REPL, or by using the documentation tab in Adam slash Juno. There are a lot of YouTube channels where you can find free videos about Julia, or about programming in general. The two that I will mention are the Julia Programming Language channel and the MIT OpenCourseWare channel. There are many websites that also have a lot of information about Julia, or about programming in general. The official Julia documentation can be found at julialang.org. They also operate Julia Academy, which contains many video tutorials about Julia. You have to register, but it's free. That website is juliaacademy.com. And finally, there's Rosetta Code, which I used extensively for my tutorial series. They are located at rosettacode.org. The Julia community can also be found on various platforms, like Discourse, GitHub, Reddit, Slack, and Stack Overflow. I will provide a link to all of these resources in the description below. This is the place where I should insert a trailer containing a preview of coming attractions. However, I haven't recorded it yet. In fact, I haven't even written it yet. This will be the last video that I will be uploading in 2020. I will be taking a break to write the next tutorial series, which will begin sometime in January 2021. It will be another 13-part series that will be an intro to data analysis and data visualization. I haven't written it yet, but conceptually, it will be like this Julia for Beginner series where I go through the basics of data analysis for beginners, and we'll go in more detail about how to generate plots and how to visually present your analysis. I haven't come up with a title yet, but if you're interested, please be sure to subscribe so you know where the new series begins. Finally, I want to thank all of you who have subscribed to this channel. I know that your time is valuable and that you have a lot of choices for how you choose to spend your time. So I thank you for spending some time on a small, unknown channel. As a parting gift to my subscribers, I have prepared a little graduation ceremony for you. On this channel, I do not hand out worthless certifications. Oh no. You can now officially turn in your noob card for your official Talented Amateur card. And I know you wouldn't want some personalized handwritten card from me. <laughs> Here, you get only the finest and cold and impersonal dystopian automation as of this recording, there are 36 subscribers. So, for my first 36 subscribers, this is for you. Hey, Dabbling Doggo here. Thanks to everyone for watching this series. I hope that you and your family all have a happy and healthy holiday season. And I hope to see you all again next year. Bye for now.